All right, so today we're going to continue on with our look at uh, problem solving, but uh, before we do that, we're going to have a concurrent uh, social media development assignment. So remember, you're working on uh, number seven right now, uh, promoting some presentations uh, at the URC. That was all part of our give before you take kind of strategy for developing our uh, social media presence. Uh, so we're going to continue with that, and we're going to uh, continue to promote the uh, the URC, uh, that undergraduate research conference, where you can see a lot of very exciting, very interesting research being done uh, by your uh, peers, by your fellow undergrads. Um, so what we're going to do uh, for this one is uh, this is going to probably be uh, a little bit more involved, but also uh, a lot more uh, hopefully rewarding. So this is going to be bonus points for actually attending a URC presentation. So we've been promoting the presentations. Now you can earn uh, points, uh, bonus points towards your grade for actually attending URC presentations, which uh, you should be doing uh, just to kind of get involved with that aspect of your academic career. But also uh, now you can earn points as you're doing it. So what we're going to do for this kind of track your um, track your uh, attendance, is I'm going to ask you to uh, tweet a reaction uh, from one presentation that you go to uh, from any panel. So the way that the URC is set up, they're set up in different panels. They'll collect three to five presentations, three to five research projects that all revolve around the same topic. And then you can choose a panel to go to. You go to the panel and you can enjoy uh, you know, four research projects on that topic. So what I'm asking you to do is go to a panel and then for any one of those presentations, just tweet your reaction. So this is very common if you go to a professional conference. They will, you will see reactions pouring out of that conference throughout the weekend. You'll see them saying, you know, just attended this great talk. Uh, you know, amazing research being done by this person. So that's what we're asking you to do. Tweet your reaction uh, from uh, to one presentation from any panel. And uh, basically for this one, we're asking for a pic and a post. So take an image, take a shot of the presenter. Uh, let's do this one with a little bit of visual uh, information as well. So you would take a shot, for example, here we got um, uh, uh, Leonard, <coughs> Lauren Leonard, uh, presenting on uh, preventing autistic stereotypes in the classroom. So you would take a shot of it and then uh, post that shot with a tweet, just something like this, just saw Lauren Leonard's talk on preventing autistic stereotypes in a classroom. Hashtag it, IUSB URC2019. Uh, give it a reaction uh, and then support undergraduate research and hashtag IUSB2019. Uh, so that's what we're asking for again. It's a pick and a post, just a reaction to any uh, presentation from a panel. So tweet your reaction uh, for any presentation from any panel. And there are three panels in total. So you can do this up to three times uh, to earn... Uh, Basically, three times the bonus points uh, for this one. So three panels, three tweets uh, are possible. And uh, the due date on this is Monday, April 15th. So we got the URC on Friday. And then at just some point, either on that day, over the weekend, or uh, before midnight on Monday, uh, post those three picks, three tweets, and uh, help uh, promote, uh, again, this uh, research community uh, that you are becoming a part of. All right, so that's that social media development. Again, URC happening this Friday here, actually, in this building. Uh, so, um, again, I have posted the program. It's in your uh, URC um, files, it should be. Um, and uh, you can just kind of peruse through there and find a talk that piques your interest. All right, so back now to problem solving. So last time we met, we introduced the idea of problem solving. Uh, so we're going to do a brief uh, recap, and then we're going to further our look at problem solving by taking a look at uh, functional fixedness. So uh, we saw that restructuring is one of the ways that uh, psychologists understand how we solve problems. Functional fixedness is actually one of the ways that uh, psychologists have found uh, where our problem solving abilities are inhibited uh, because of our functional fixedness. We're also going to take a look at a mental set, yet another phenomenon that can make it difficult to solve a problem. And uh, then we're going to do a test on incubation effects and uh, then wrap it up with 
inside problems. And then if we get to it, uh, we will go from inside problems into an information processing approach. So once again, bringing that idea of information in, information out, what goes on in between, to see how problem solving uh, psychologists who uh, research problem solving have structured and thought about these problems. What is it that we do when we're trying to solve a, uh, a difficult problem? All right, so just a real quick recap. Remember that a problem requires two things. Number one, you need an obstacle between your goal state and your present state. So an obstacle between where you are and where you want to get to. And it cannot be immediately obvious how to get around that obstacle. So we saw the example with Kohler's uh, chimpanzees, where they were on one side of a fence, present state. The banana was on the other side of the fence. The banana was a goal state. Not immediately obvious how to reach the banana because it's out of reach. So they had to come up with a solution such as putting two sticks together so they could reach the banana. And then we also took a look at wordies. So hopefully you, uh, you recall the solutions that you came up with last time. And uh, these were picture word, word puzzles that illustrated a, a common phrase. So this one, Daffy, Donald, and Mallard. This is ducks in a row. So we're going to use the wordies to kind of uh, do an in-class demo on incubation effects to see if we can get any incubation effects uh, over the weekend. And then lastly, we took a look at restructuring. And restructuring was the idea that you need to represent a problem in order to even think about it. So if you're thinking about something, that means you have a representation of that thing somewhere in your mind. And some things are problems. Some uh, uh, goal states constitute a problem because we structure them in a way where the solution is not immediately obvious. So sometimes we structure a problem the wrong way. Uh, and then if we can restructure it into a more suitable uh, framework, that actually makes solving the problem much easier and much, uh, much more possible. So we saw this example with the uh, parking space uh, riddle. So if you structure the problem as a bizarre number sequence, very, very difficult to solve. If you restructure the problem as an inverted view of this parking lot, massively easy to solve. The number is 87. So again, it's that restructuring that allows you to solve the problem. We saw this earlier in the semester where you had the train problem with the seagull, and if you structured it as a distance problem, you'd probably still be here trying to solve it. But if you structure it as a time problem, it becomes much more easy to solve. And then the last example was the monk on a hill problem, where you have a monk begins at the bottom of the hill at 9 a.m., ends at the top of the hill at 9 p.m. The next day starts at the top of the hill at 9 a.m., ends at the bottom of the hill at 9 p.m. Is there a way for that monk not to be at the same position uh, at the same time on um, both days? And uh, again, if you represent it, as most people often do, as two separate trips, very difficult to solve. But if you represent it as two overlapping trips, then it makes it much more easier to see that at some point he will have to cross with himself. He'll be at the same point at the same time, regardless of his path, um, his timeline up and down the hill. All right, and then the last thing we touched on is how restructuring is actually massive in science. So many of the leaps that have occurred in science have occurred because of restructuring. So um, the uh, cognitive psychology currently has an issue with this, uh, with consciousness and why we have consciousness, because we have structured mental operations in a certain way, and that structuring is not allowing us to solve the problem of consciousness. So we need to restructure it. We need new concepts, new ways of thinking about thinking and, and cognition in order to solve this. Uh, another very famous uh, example is the um, geocentric versus heliocentric uh, view of the solar system. So when, um, when the uh, uh, heliocentric um, view of the solar system, the view that the planets revolve around the sun, when that first came out, uh, it was actually less accurate than the geocentric version. It's just that the geocentric version was so massively complicated that it made solving any other problems in uh, physics, like uh, the problem of gravity and how you stay in orbit, extremely difficult. Move to the heliocentric, all of a sudden, all those issues become uh, much more easy to solve, and that is because of restructuring. All right, so on to the new stuff. Functional fixedness. So functional fixedness is another phenomenon that psychologists have identified 
that is an impediment to solving problems. It's, it's a restriction. It's one of the things that makes solving problems difficult. And what it is, it's the restricting of the use of an object to its familiar functions. It's actually fixing an object and only using it in the way that is typical, in the way that is familiar, uh, you are fixing the function. So uh, one example of functional fixedness would be if you use the fork uh, as a fork. So using a fork to eat food with, this is an example of functional fixedness because this is the way that you typically use a fork. You have fixed its function in this uh, scenario. If you ever want to see functional fixedness uh, broken, if you ever want to see examples that um, overcome functional fixedness, all you really got to do is just Google life hacks, and you will see people coming up with anti-functional fixedness solutions to a number of things. So a fork can be used as a fork. That's functional fixedness. It can also be used as a uh, corkscrew uh, to get a cork out of a bottle. It can also be used to help you cook your onion rings. Um, it can apparently be used for makeup. So much makeup can be done with a fork and a spoon apparently as well. So this is an example of overcoming functional fixedness because if you wanted to know how to get that perfect cat eye and you had a fork sitting there, if you fell for functional fixedness, if you fell victim to functional fixedness, you'd be looking at that fork and saying, I can't solve my problem with this fork because the fork is for eating. I don't have any food here. I'm not trying to eat, uh, so I can't use the fork. If you overcome functional fixedness, all of a sudden, getting that straight line, you solve that problem because you're using the fork in a way that it's not typically intended to. So functional fixedness, uh, this is uh, to extend kind of the idea this is where you also uh, try to solve a problem using the most common representations. So the most common ways of thinking about a phenomenon, the most common ways of using a concept. Uh, it can be extended beyond the physical realm in terms of just the most common ideas uh, that are applied. And uh, what this does is it gives us a failure to solve the problem because we fail to use certain representations, right? So we fail to use the, uh, the fork as a straight line drawing tool. We fail to use the fork as something that you can prop things up on. We fail to use the fork in any other way but a fork, and that can lead us to a failure to solve uh, certain problems. So I got another example for that, and uh, it is the functional fixedness of this hole in the wall. So uh, if anybody has ever seen this or has known, uh, has seen any Looney Tunes cartoons or any other cartoons, um, you know what made this wall, this hole in the wall, right? Somebody has run through this hole. And when you look at that hole in the wall, not only do you know that somebody went through that wall, but you know exactly how they went through it. You know exactly which parts of their body went through which part. So what part of their body caused this? The head. So this was caused by the head. What about this? That's the arm. What about this? That's the leg. So we've seen this countless times, and we know that the typical use of this part of the hole is that's where your head goes. The typical use of this part of the hole is that where that's where the arm goes. The typical use of this part is that's where the leg goes. That's functional fixedness, using this for the leg, this for the arm, and this for the head. So we're going to take a uh, look at an example where people fail to solve problems specifically because they fall for that functional fixedness. And uh, for this, we're going to turn to that wonderful uh, place of psychological phenomenon, uh, which is Japanese game shows. All right. So this is a show called Human Tetris. And uh, we need volume on this. Let me just make sure I got that. Nicely done. All right, so this is the show. Where's my mouse? Human Tetris. And let's check this out. And again, you're going to see functional fixedness in the show. 
All right, so notice you have a problem here that needs to be solved, right? There's a certain way to represent this problem. And in this case, functional fixedness, the most typical way to represent this problem is to say, all right, this is a hole that was made by a human being. That's where your head goes. That's where your arm goes. That's where your leg goes. And keep an eye to, uh, on problems that can be solved this way and ones that fail to be solved in that particular manner. All right, so he was successful. Remember that example. one all right so that was the last one so there were problems there that needed to be solved and uh, some of them were successfully solved and some of them were not so uh, successfully solved so let's take a look at uh, some of the ones that were solved some of the ones that failed and see how functional fixedness played a role in whether they were able to come up with a solution or not come up with a solution for this problem so let's start off with this one right here so if you recall on this uh, particular hole, this contestant was successful. He was successful in uh, solving this problem, uh, putting his body into a position where he could go through that hole in the wall. And part of the reason for this is because this particular problem did not activate any sort of functional fixedness uh, in terms of his representations. So this does not look like a human. So there was no pre-made representations where you said, all right, I have to put my head here, my legs there. That whole thing was not human-like at all. So there were no representations that were forced upon this individual. There were no representations that were typical 
And because of that, he actually very easily just found a way through and said, I'm going to put my head here. I'm going to put my legs over here. So that was an example of a solution that was solved correctly because it lacked any sort of functional fixedness. On the other hand, this one was an example where there was functional fixedness because when you take a look at that hole in the wall right there, uh, it is in the shape of an individual. So it's in the shape of a baby, but it's still in a human shape. So your cognitive representations are activated. Your cognitive representations of what goes where is activated. And you know that this head hole over here is where my head should go. It's where my head would typically go in a typical solution. You know that your legs typically would go over here. So this is the head hole, this is the leg hole. That's how you're supposed to solve this particular, um, this particular uh, problem here. And uh, we can see that he fell for that. He fell for trying to solve this problem in that particular way. You can see his head, he tried to put it up there. He tried to see his legs, he bent his legs, but still his legs were going over there. And he, was, uh, he failed to solve this particular uh, hole. However, very nicely, they provided us with the solution right down here. And you can see, now when you take a look at the solution, it's a little pixelated because we have to zoom in on it. Uh, but you can see for the solution, the way that you solve this problem is not is by breaking functional fixedness, not using the representations that are typical. Your head does not go here. Your head goes down here. This is where the head goes. So you got to lie on your back, split your legs, one over here, one over here, so this is one knee over here, this is one knee over there. You basically lie on your back, split your legs. That's how you solve this particular problem. The only way to solve this is to not fall for that functional fixedness using the holes the way that we typically would. And then we saw this example over here where this individual overcame functional fixedness to very easily solve this problem here. So once again, we have this human shaped hole in the wall. Once again, our representations let us know this is where your head would typically go. Uh, this is where your legs would typically go. And uh, this solution here would require some sort of jump into a you know position and in order to pass through the entire wall. This person was able to solve this because they broke with that functional fixedness and they said, you know what, I'm not gonna put my legs over here. I'm not gonna put my hands over here. And this one was actually very anticlimactic because he just stepped through the wall. It was easy as pie. Uh, very easy problem to solve uh, once you get out of that kind of functional fixedness. All right, are there any questions about functional fixedness? All right. Okay, so let's take a look at another phenomenon in problem solving. This one is known as mental set. And mental set is uh, related to functional fixedness, but it's more uh, set up by the problem itself. So it's kind of like um, not so much that you're fixed in the way that you represent things in a problem, but you're fixed in the moves that you make for a particular problem. So people often have uh, preconceived notions of how to solve a problem, and uh, it uh, creates a mental set that's an impediment to actually solving the problem. So I'll give you an example of uh, a problem that uh, can contribute to mental sets. It's called eggs in a basket. So I'll read it out for you. It goes, there are six eggs in a basket. Six people take one of the eggs each. No eggs are added to the basket. How is it that one egg can still be left in the basket? So that's the problem right there. I'll give you a couple minutes to try to solve it. There are six eggs in a basket. Six people take one of the eggs each. No eggs are added to the basket. How is it that one egg can still be left in the basket? All right, so try to work out a solution and we'll see if we can get any correct solutions.
<laughs> All right, so no, uh, don't, uh, don't blurt out the solution, but has anybody solved the problem? Was anybody able to come up with a way that one egg would still be left in the basket? Show of hands. We got a few. Everybody else not able to come up with the, the final scenario, the final solution? We just, I think we just got one. <laughs> okay, so, um, so this, this uh, problem is difficult because it sets up a mental set. So this problem is a multi-step problem, and the difficulty comes because the problem itself lures you in to creating your own mental set, creating your own preconceived notion of how to solve a problem basically based on your success at solving the problem up to a point. So let's take a look at how this would work. So you got your basket there, you got your six eggs, and you need to get to a uh, state where everybody has an egg. And uh, that's basically your goal. You wanna get to the goal where all six people have taken one egg. And right now you got six eggs in the basket, you got nobody with an egg, so you're far away from your goal. And you start to solve your goal basically step by step. So the first step, step number one, you just say, all right, person number one takes an egg. And then what you do is you evaluate your situation after applying that particular strategy. After applying that way of solving this problem, person one takes an egg. You take a look at your situation and you're like, all right, I used to have nobody with an egg and six eggs in my basket. Now I got one person with an egg and only five eggs in my basket. I'm closer to that solution, everybody has an egg. So you say, all right, I'll do it again. Right? Let me try this strategy again. Person number two takes an egg. And once again, you mentally reevaluate and you say to yourself, you know what? Success number two, because now I got two people, each with one egg. I only got four eggs in the basket. That, that brings me closer. So you've applied this strategy of a person taking an egg twice, and so far twice it's been successful. So you try it again, step three, let me do this one more time. Person number three gets an egg. Once again, you reevaluate and you notice the strategy has been successful. So taking an egg from the basket has become a successful strategy. So you try it again, step four. Person number four takes an egg, brings you even closer. Step five, person number five takes an egg, brings you even closer. And then all of a sudden you get stuck because you have used this successful strategy five times in a row. And that success five times in a row has created a mental set. It's created a preconceived notion on how to solve this problem because you have been successful five times in a row. And now applying that to the last egg will leave you unsuccessful because you will have zero eggs in the basket. <coughs> so now this is where the problem gets difficult. Most of you that did not were not able to solve the problem we're probably stuck at this place, right? You probably weren't stuck with six eggs in a basket going, what can we do? You were probably stuck here. And the solution is to not use any of those mental sets, not use that preconceived notion. Don't use that strategy that has worked five times. You have to break that set. And step number six is that the person actually takes an egg, but they take it by taking the whole basket. So they take the whole basket. They have one egg. There's still an egg in the basket. Everybody has an egg but that is an example of a mental set. So what makes this very difficult is that you have had five instances where a particular strategy has worked, and that sets you into this mental set. Your mind literally tells you, this has worked before, let me do this again. This has worked before, let me do this again. This has worked before, of course I'm gonna do it again. And then you get stuck because when you get to step number six, you just, you can't uh, break that mental set, it's difficult to break that mental set. On the other hand, if we just started with this, if we just said, 
there's one egg in a basket, there's one person, and they're going to get an egg, but they need to, it still needs to be in the basket. That would be simple. You would just be like, they just take the basket with the egg. Simple. Uh, but it becomes difficult because you got to break that mental set that was set up with five consecutive successes of doing things in a particular way. So mental sets, mental sets are uh, in our um, society all the time, and they're in the way that we think all the time, because we often rely on strategies that were previously successful. And why wouldn't we, right? Why wouldn't we do what has worked before, right? Why wouldn't we say to ourselves, you know what? On that last test, I made notes about what I read in the textbook, and I got a, you know, an A+. Plus. I think I'll do that strategy again. Usually a mental set kind of works well in our favor. However, sometimes when a problem becomes unsolvable, it can be due to the fact that we just keep trying to apply that same exact solution to this particular problem. And you can see this in terms of so many times when technology is introduced and people miss the boat on technology. People just miss this opportunity and uh, one of the big ones that I remember, uh, it happened, this might, this might be too, too much for, uh, for some of you, but if anybody remembers Napster, if anybody remembers the file sharing, music sharing uh, uh, program that was Napster, this was in the golden age of sharing <laughs> your music, when it was completely legal and completely free to just put your music collection up on a cloud and people can peruse through it and download copies of your MP3s. So Napster was set up and uh, people uh, in the music industry did not enjoy it. So Dr. Dre and Metallica came after Napster <coughs> hard and uh, basically shut it down because they had a mental set in their mind. They had the mental set of you create CDs, you create uh, cassette tapes and records and you go to a store and you sell them. That's how music is distributed. That was, that's what was successful in the past. That's not what this person is doing. Therefore, we're going to shut it down. Nobody took a look at Napster and said, you know what? Let's use this structure that this person, this person developed and let's break this mental set. Clearly people want the ease of downloading music in their own homes. Maybe we could just turn it into an actual legal business and charge people for it. So most people were sitting there going, mental set, no. You know, CDs is the way you do it. Sell it in stores, that's the way, that's the way you do it. And somebody at Apple said, uh, mental set, goodbye. Uh, why don't we just take what Napster did? We'll call it iTunes. And for a while, Apple cornered the market uh, because they also had that digital rights management thing. I don't know if they still have that. But if you lived in the dark days of digital rights management, you know that all the songs that you downloaded with your iTunes could not be played anywhere else. So by breaking that mental set and saying, you know what, maybe music doesn't have to be sold in a store, uh, they were able to solve this problem and uh, take advantage of this huge, huge market. All right, um, incubation effects. So this is one of the last uh, kind of problem song phenomenon we're gonna take a look at today. And an incubation effect is, uh, we probably all have experienced this, this is where you set aside a problem for a, a certain period of time. And uh, you're unsuccessful at solving it, you're trying to solve the problem, you just can't do it, and you just say, you know what, I'm taking a break. I'm just gonna set this aside, I need to step away from this particular problem. And then when you come back to the problem, oftentimes you get a quick solution. Right? So oftentimes you bang your head against the wall for hours trying to solve a problem, step away from it for a couple of hours, and as soon as you come back, within five minutes, you're like, oh my gosh, I solved it. That's known as an incubation effect, that successful solution after stepping away from a problem. So we're going to see if we can get uh, any uh, incubation effects in just a moment, but uh, there used to be an explanation for incubation effects. They found this to be um, incorrect. And uh, the incorrect explanation, but this one kind of makes more intuitive sense, and it's a nice example of why we need to do the research that we do as psychologists. The incorrect explanation was that incubation effects were due to an unconscious process where your unconscious mind continued to work on the problem. So you might not have been thinking about it, but somewhere in your mind, the gears were still uh, turning 
trying to crank through a solution of that problem. And then when you revisit it, you bring that solution up to consciousness. And all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, I solved the problem. So the idea was that when you step away, there's this process you're unaware of, this unconscious process that is solving the problem while you're away. They show that, researchers show that to be uh, not the case. The current best explanation for what incubation effects entail is that what you're doing in an incubation effect is you're forgetting about those inappropriate strategies that you've been applying. You're basically uh, restarting or resetting your mental set. So you have tried to solve this problem, and because we are wired the way that we are, problem solving is difficult because we need to restructure. Problem solving is difficult because of functional fixedness. Problem solving is difficult because of mental sets. Problem solving is difficult because we like to do things the way we've always done them. And sometimes we just can't get around that unless we step away, our mind kind of forgets the strategy that we were trying, and then when we come back, we try a new strategy, and that strategy is successful. So we're going to see if we can get any incubation effects in here. So we're going to go through the wordies one more time. Remember, I promise you we will uh, show you the solutions. We're going to do that right now. So I'm going to show you the same wordies that we saw last time and uh, try to solve them again. And we'll see if we can get any new solutions now that we've stepped away from it for um, more than a weekend. All right. So here they are. So what phrase, common phrase, is being illustrated by that wordie? All right. So write down a solution. I'll give you about a minute on each of these. All right, let's try the next one. All right, number three. All right, last one. All right, so let's start at the first one. Okay, so show of hands if you were not able to solve this on Thursday. So the first time we saw this was on Thursday. So how many people were not able to solve it on Thursday? 
All right, and out of those people that were not able to solve it, how many solved it now? Okay, so for those of you that were unable to solve it on Thursday, but were able to solve it now, that's an example of an incubation effect. So when we first tried this on Thursday, you were trying to solve it, trying to solve it, trying to solve it, could not, probably because you were applying a mental set. You were thinking about it one way, one way, one way. And then when we came back today and you saw it again, forgot about that inappropriate strategy and were able to uh, come to the correct, um, the correct interpretation. So uh, anybody want to yell out what the solution is? It's three blind mice. So for those of you that weren't able to solve this, this is three blind mice because this is three uh, mice, uh, but they don't have any eyes. They don't have eyes, they can't see, they're blind. Three blind mice. So that's the solution. And again, if you were able to solve it today, when you were unable to solve it on Thursday, that's an example of an incubation effect. All right, was anybody not able, was anybody able to solve this today when they were unable to solve it on Thursday? We get any solutions here? All right, once again, we got a couple of incubation effects. This one, what's the phrase? This is the phrase nine to five. This is what you need to work if you get a regular, typical office job, uh, you're working nine to five. And because uh, you got the nine and you got two fives. Uh, this one I actually uh, have a special fondness for because uh, one time in this class, I had a, a Chinese uh, immigrant student. So this individual, he immigrated from China and, uh, you know, English as a second language. So he didn't understand some of the phrases. So this one, when we solved it, he was like, you know, this nine to five, what is nine to five? And I told him, I go in a typical work week, you know, workers will start working at nine and then they'll, they'll end at five and they'll go home. And he was shocked, right? He was just like nine to five. Like that's a thing, uh, because his, his culture is different. It's, in, in China and a lot of other countries, uh, the phrase would be before your boss shows up and after your boss leaves. That's when you get to go home as a worker. Uh, so nine to five was a foreign idea. All right, this one is difficult. This is probably the mo most challenging one. Was anybody able to solve it today when you were unable to solve this on Thursday? Maybe. Was anybody able to just solve this in general? Do you, you wanna take a stab? Not really. Okay. All right. <laughs> no, I get that. Okay. So this one is actually very difficult and we're not going to get incubation effects every single time, but for this one, the word is sight. Is it so hiding in plain sight? It's not, it's not hiding in plain sight. The word is sight, but it's missing its end. So it has no end. There is no end in sight. Oh, so this is the fun. phrase, no end in sight. And it's very difficult, right? This one is particularly challenging. Um, but that's the phrase, no end in sight. There's no end, the word is sight, no end in sight. All right, let's see if we can get an incubation effect on this last one here. Was anybody able to solve this today, but unable to solve it on Thursday? All right, we got a couple of people. So once again, that would be an example of an incubation effect. So on Thursday, you might have been looking at this and say, be saying, you know, bad before errs, errs after bad. No, that's not, uh, that's not the way it goes. Um, you know, um, Darth Vader's, can I find Darth in here somewhere? No, that's not the way it goes. So you keep applying incorrect strategies, but then when you come back, you know, today, your mind has forgotten about those, helps you break your mental set and helps you see that this word is Vader's, but there's a space in Vader's. This is space invaders. All right. So once again, being able to solve this can come about because you're able to uh, break your mental set by forgetting about it, right? So you just step away, your mind forgets about what you used to be doing, and uh, you're able to solve it, and that's how incubation seems to work. So, you know, uh, incubation is one of the best uh, kind of reasons why, um, if you're doing work, so especially now, at the end of the semester, when I know a lot of assignments are going to be uh, coming up due, uh, if you are working on something and you just cannot solve it, one of the uh, strategies you can do is you can just take a break, step away from it for like an hour, do something else, think about something else, take a break. That's one uh, possible solution. If you cannot take a break, like if you just are like, man, I got so many things to do, 
Another thing that you can do to kind of instill or um, set up incubation effects is work on some other assignment that requires a different set of strategies, requires a different kind of set of uh, mental structures and mental um, uh, you know, restructuring. And then that, as long as it's not the problem that you're working on, will help you break your mental set. So when you come back to your original assignment, you might sit there and say, you know what, I didn't know how to tie up the end of my introduction. I didn't know how to synthesize all these ideas. So I stepped away, I started doing my math homework, and an hour later when I came back, oh, of course, what, this is the way to do it, this is the solution. So give that a shot if you ever do find yourself banging your head against the wall or trying to solve uh, a particular, in this case, assignment. All right, inside problems. So the last thing we're going to take a look at in terms of um, types of problems and issues in problem solving is the inside problem. And an inside problem... Uh, this is, it's not as an inside problem because these are problems in which uh, the person trying to solve it are unaware that they're close to a solution. So the eggs in the basket was not an inside problem because in the eggs in the basket problem, you were well aware that you were getting closer to a solution. You were well aware that I had six eggs in the basket, now I got five. I had five eggs, now I got four. I got four eggs, now I got three you saw that you were moving closer and closer to that solution. And an inside problem, these are ones where you are unaware, you have no idea that you're actually getting close to a particular solution. And the reason for this is oftentimes that an inside problem requires only one step. So it's a simple step, it's a very straightforward step. The challenge is in finding what that step is. So I got two examples for an inside problem. We'll start off with the haystack problem. So the haystack was important because the cloth ripped. That's the statement. The haystack was important because the cloth ripped. Why did the cloth ripping make the haystack important? So try to come up with a reason why a cloth ripping would all of a sudden make a haystack important. All right, I'll give you a couple of, uh, maybe about 30 seconds. All right, any ideas? Any ideas why all of a sudden that haystack became massively important? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a possibility. That's not the answer we're looking for, <laughs> but that's a possibility, right? The cloth ripped, there's a needle in the haystack. How else are you gonna fix your cloth unless you go get that needle? So all of a sudden the haystack was important. So it makes sense, but it's not the correct answer. Yep. Either one of these, but I've got two suggestions. Okay. Either one because the hay, the, the hay must have been heavy, so if the cloth ripped, maybe they get more money out of it. Okay. Or second, if somebody's wearing the cloth and it rips, the haystack would be really important because that's a tight knot. Okay, so again, <laughs> so I was like, oh, there's two ideas. solutions that make sense, right? If the cloth rips, all of a sudden you got to hide behind the haystack, right? Because you don't want to be caught out in public you know, uh, half nude, or perhaps, uh, you know, it was a, um, it was a sign of the, the weight of the hay. You were carrying it in the cloth and because the cloth ripped, it's like, oh my gosh, we have so much hay here. Um, and there's a bunch of other possibilities here, all of which are incorrect, right? So maybe this was, um, a family that sold cloths and sold hay. And when the cloth ripped, all of a sudden they weren't able to sell it for the food that they needed. So the hay became massively important because it's now their only source of income. Uh, maybe um, after the cloth ripped, uh, the haystack became important because now they started making clothes out of hay, right? So they started making the little hula skirts out of the hay or something. Uh, there's a lot of possibilities, a lot of potential ways of solving this. All of those are incorrect, though, because the solution about why the haystack became important because of the nature of the cloth, and that's the nature of the cloth. So it was a parachute. So the cloth was a parachute, and once that cloth ripped, all of a sudden that haystack became massively important because the skydiver had to lay in the had to land in the hay uh, in order to save their lives. 
So notice that once I gave this solution, a lot of you you were like, oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, right? Insight. All of a sudden you're like, oh, that makes, oh, of course. And notice it's a very simple solution, right? Not one of you is sitting here going, whoa, 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 back up a second. The the parachute ripped. What's there's gravity? There's like all of you get it immediately, right? All of you are like, oh, of course. That's why the haystack is important. So that's an inside problem. It seems to only take one step, right? It's that one step. The cloth is the parachute, and all of a sudden you have the entire solution. All right, I'll give you one more, uh, one more of these. This was making the rounds on social media about, uh, I think, like a year ago. So uh, this is known as a funeral problem. And uh, I'll, I'll read it out to you. It goes, this is a story about a woman. Uh, while at the funeral of her own mother, she met a guy whom she did not know. She thought this guy was amazing, uh, so much the dream guy she was searching for, that she fell in love with him immediately. However, she never asked for his name or number and afterwards could not find anyone who knew who he was. A few days later, the, gil the girl killed her own sister. Question, why did she kill her sister? So there's a scenario. What? Try to come up with a reason. I'll read it one more time. <laughs> All right. So this is a story about a woman. While at the funeral of her own mother, she met a guy whom she did not know. She thought this guy was amazing, so much a dream guy that she was searching for that she fell in love with him immediately. However, she never asked for his name or number and afterward could not find anyone who knew who he was. A few days later, the girl killed her own sister. Question, why did she kill her sister? So who thinks they have a solution? All right, I'll give a few more seconds to try to see if we can get other insights. Incidentally, this problem is also a little bit difficult because it involves uh, a little bit of functional fixedness. And I'll point that out in just a moment. All right, who, who has a solution? Why did she kill her sister? Mm -hmm. She wanted him to come to another funeral. So she reasoned that if the guy appeared at her mother's funeral, then he might appear at another family's funeral. <laughs> So, yeah, no, it is dark. <laughs> so that's the solution. And again, it's an insight problem. It's it, once you get that kind of idea that the guy appeared at one family funeral, maybe he'll appear at another. Once you get that step, once again, the solution is obvious. So once again, nobody here is, is saying, well, wait a second, tra trace the logic out for me one more time. It was at a family funeral, you know, and, um, uh, you know, uh, she killed her sister. That's a family. Where's the? No, you get it right away. Uh, it's just that one step. And this is actually, uh, this made the rounds um, because it was falsely claimed to be a test that where you can identify a psychopath. So it was one of those questions where they were like, you know, uh, only, only psychopaths answer this riddle correctly, right? This is a, a test of psychopaths. And, uh, you know, psychologists stepped in and were like, no, no, not at all. Put it on BuzzFeed, but this isn't, you know, that test for it. But um, it does have a little bit of functional fixedness that kind of, I think, prevents uh, people from solving this. So does anybody know what the kind of functional fixedness is, what that typical representation is that might impede this solution? Was it trying to figure out who the guy was? She said nobody knew who he was. I mean, that's what I was stuck on for a while, was trying to, like, oh, which, who, which guy was it? And then the... Mm -hmm. So that's an example. It's not that's not exactly the functional fixingness I was looking for, but that's an example of again. This is a one-step solution. You were you were stepping along the wrong path in this case. You you went the wrong way, and even if it's a simple straight line, if you're looking in the wrong area, like maybe how do you figure out who this guy is? Uh, that'll prevent you from that. But in terms of functional fixingness, in terms of thinking of things in one way, is it like about a funeral? Not not a funeral. Yeah. Uh, it was the sister's husband. That's what no, I mean. not the sister's husband. Is it the idea that there would have to be some sort of conflict between the sisters for her to therefore kill her? That would be more in line with the functional fixedness. So as soon as you see, oh, she killed her own sister, you might think to yourself, oh, well, they must have had a feud, right? Why else would you kill a family member? 
unless you had a few. But there is one more reason, and that is the idea of a female psychopath. So whenever people think of psychopaths, or when they think of serial killers, usually the image that comes to mind is a male. It's a male, right? So you take take a look at you know uh, movies, take a look at media, take a look at who the psychopaths, serial killers are that are out there. It's typically male, 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 male. That's what caused uh, what can cause a lot of uh, difficulty solving this because in order for you to solve this, you have to represent the sister as a murdering psychopath. You have to represent her as this cold, unemotional, unfeeling individual. And uh, that functional fixedness of having that idea in our society that uh, your typical psychopath is a male uh, is one of the reasons why I think this was not, you know, a man meets the woman of his dreams at his mother's funeral. I think that would have been a lot more straightforward uh, to solve. All right, so again, these problems only require one step. Uh, so why would these problems be difficult? Why is it that that one step is so difficult uh, to take? Uh, we're actually um, going to uh, answer that, not next time, we're gonna start answering it right now because we got a little bit of time left over. So we're gonna introduce the idea of problem spaces and then uh, when we uh, come back on Thursday, we're gonna uh, further our look at problem solving by taking a look at how those problem spaces help us understand what's going on in our minds when we solve problems. All right, so we are now gonna introduce the information processing approach. Uh, we're gonna take a look at uh, operator selection. We're not gonna get through all of this, um, but we'll see where we can get to. And we'll take a look at operator selection, basically how do you navigate uh, the uh, problem space, backup avoidance, difference, reduction method, means and analysis, and then we'll reapply it to inside problems to see why these inside problems are so, so very difficult. All right, information processing approach. One of the best illustrations of the information processing approach uh, is the Tower of Hanoi. So how do we solve this uh, Tower of Hanoi problem? So this was invented by uh, Edward Lucas in 1883. And the problem is, is that you have a series of disks stacked on top of each other where each disk is uh, smaller than the one beneath it. And you need to move the entire stack to another rod, or in this case, another space. But there are very specific rules on, how, on what you can do. So the rules are you can only move one disc at a time. So you can only pick up one disc and move one disc at a time. And then the other rule is that only, well, no, sorry, it's three. <laughs> the next one is that only the upper disc on each rod can be moved. So in this case, all you can do is grab that green disc and move it. You can't grab the red one. It's just the top one on each stack. And then uh, finally, no disc can be placed on top of a smaller disc. So they gotta be stacked like a pyramid at all times, stacked like a tower. So you can never put the red disc on top of the green. And the question is, how do you move this entire stack so it goes into either one of these other two spaces following those rules over there. So has anybody ever done the Tower of Hanoi? You did it yet for the three, yeah, yeah. for the problem. Uh, has anybody ever, asked, so other people have actually played with it? So there are um, uh, different levels to this. So there's like a five disc, seven disc, you know, 11 disc problem. Uh, but they're, they're uh, one of the ways to illustrate the idea of a uh, information processing approach because it's a well-defined problem that is easily visualized. So we're gonna use it to introduce some of the concepts we're gonna be looking at. So the first one is a state. So the term state in problem solving refers to uh, a representation of your problem at some degree of solution. So your problem can either be completely beginning, that's one state, it can be completely solved, that's another state, or it can be somewhere in between. Right, that's, uh, that's the third type of state. So a state is a representation of the problem in some degree of solution. And you can differentiate three major types of states. The first one is the initial state. And the initial state, that's the start state. That's where you are at the beginning. That would be this right here in the Tower of Hanoi. So the initial state is where you're starting uh, with your problem. The goal state is the second type of state 
and the goal state is the solution of the problem. So for the Tower of Hanoi, the solution to the problem would be this state right here, where you have the three disks, they're stacked on another location, that's your goal. So this is the initial state, that's the goal state, and then the last type of state is the intermediate state. And the intermediate state is basically any situations, any states on the way to the goal. So these are any sort of possible middle parts to this uh, solution. So one intermediate state for the Tower of Hanoi would be that configuration right there. That is a possible place that you might find yourself on your way to the goal state. So using these, uh, this idea of states, you can define what's known as a problem space. And a problem space is a representation of the various states of a problem and how they're related to each other. So it's basically, you can think of it as a map of your entire, problems, uh, of your entire problem. You create a problem space, starting with the initial state, ending with the goal state, sometimes there's more than one, and then all the possible intermediate states are represented as well. All right, so the last thing we need in these problem spaces, we talked about the various states, but then we introduced this idea of the relations between states. In a relation between a state, you can think of it, well, it's termed as an operator. And an operator are the things you can do to go from one state to another. Operators are basically the moves that you are allowed. They're the operations you're allowed to do. They're the strategies you can enact. They are, in problem space, ways of moving between states in the problem space. So let's take a look at a simplified problem space for this Tower of Hanoi problem. So we start off with our initial state. This is where you're starting. This is your uh, when the problem is handed to you. This is where you are. And uh, we can apply an operator. And again, the operators are the legal moves, the allowed uh, things that you can do. And we can apply an operator to this, and we can say, all right, we're going to take this disk, and we're going to put that disk into the second position. That is one of the legal moves in this problem. That's an operator, or that's the representation of the operator. This is an intermediate state. The only other thing that we can do from this initial state is to go down there and put that green disk into the third position. So in terms of what we are allowed to do, in terms of the intermediate states that we can reach from this initial state, that's it. Those are the only two possibilities. So far, so good? All right. So let's just stay on, uh, we'll stay on that side. Once you're here, you can also only do um, two things. You can either take that green disk and you can move it to this location here. It's a wasted move, but it's a possible move. It's a legal move. Or you can take this red disk and you can pop it back. Uh, you can put it into that second position. Those are the two things that you can do to move through this space. Technically, the other thing you can do is you can take that green disk and you can just put it right on top. So you can go up the problem space. You can go down the problem space. But it shows the relation of these intermediate states in terms of how, do you, uh, how can you navigate through and try to solve this problem. On this side, we have a similar situation. You can take the red disk and move it to uh, space three, or you can take the green disk and you can move it to uh, space three. Those are the only two things that you can do. All right, staying on that left side, from here, you can do two operations. You can either take the red disk, move it to uh, space uh, two, or you can take the green disk and put it back on top of your tower and notice that you are now back to your initial state. So there are a number of different things that you can do at each step, and some of those bring you closer to a solution. Some of those actually take you backwards from the solution, but this is what we mean by a problem space. It's the link between the initial state the goal state, through these intermediate states, and they're linked by operators. So notice there is no way to go from here to here. There's no legal move that'll take you to that intermediate state. So this helps us to understand how we navigate through this particular problem. 
And as you continue to move your discs, eventually by applying those legal operators, you will end up down here. And that right there is your goal state. That is a correct solution to the problem. And you can see that a solution to this Tower of Hanoi, the one that you uh, came up with in your head, was to just kind of travel down this arm of the Tower of Hanoi until you got to that particular goal state. So these are the moves that are the solution to this particular uh, Tower of Hanoi. So we got the goal state down there, we got the initial state up there, and then we have all those other intermediary states and correctly solving this problem involves you negotiating this problem space so that you can go all the way down, applying those legal moves and those legal operators until you get to that correct solution. So that is the approach that we're gonna be using to kind of wrap up our problem solving uh, look, uh, basically trying to figure out how is it that we can navigate this space. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are more complicated uh, versions of the Tower of Hanoi. This is the three disc problem. You can also have a seven disc Tower of Hanoi. I think that's your sort of typical, if you bought this at the store, uh, that'll be the one that you get. And if you take a look at the full problem space for the seven disc Tower of Hanoi, that's what it looks like, where the tip of this triangle up there, just the apex, just that top corner, that is your initial state. The bottoms of these states over here, I believe the ones that are connected in green, those are your goal states. And your correct solution to this problem involves you navigating this state correctly so that you eventually come all the way down to the correct goal state. So you can see that it can get very, very complicated. And we're gonna take a look at how do we actually uh, navigate these problem spaces? What are some of the strategies that we use to navigate these problem spaces? Because for a lot of real world problems, uh, it becomes very difficult to do this in our heads, right? So for the three disc tower of Hanoi, most of you could have just probably sat there and go, all right, kind of move that there, move that there. Move that there, move that there. All right, I'm done. I navigated the space. Try it for the seven disc Tower of Hanoi. And I guarantee you, you won't, you, it will not be successful. <laughs> it's very, very difficult. Uh, we're going to see it's the same moves though. So uh, interestingly, when you try, if you ever tried to program the solution to the Tower of Hanoi, to a computer, a three disc Tower of Hanoi is exactly the same difficulty as a seven disc Tower of Hanoi. It's exactly the same difficulty as a 20 disc Tower of Hanoi. You can solve the Tower of Hanoi up to as many discs as you want. It just exponentially increases the number of moves that you need to do. But it's the same as we're gonna see, it's the same exact solution every single time. Um, but again, it's navigating this problem space. So we're gonna see what we as humans, not perfect computers, what we do when we attempt to navigate this problem space because we have a difficult time representing the entire space in our minds. So you can think of it as we're kind of groping around in the dark, trying to figure our way through this problem space. So next time we meet, we're gonna take a look at some of the strategies that we use to help us navigate these problem spaces when it's not obvious what the entire space uh, might be. So are there any questions to kind of wrap up today? No, we're all good? All right. So that's it for today. Uh, if you came in late, uh, track down the sign-in sheet. Make sure that you get your name on that. Um, promote the URC. It's coming up on Friday. Try to make it out to a couple of panels and uh, let us know what you think about it. And uh, we will continue on with our look at problem solving next time we meet. Other than that, we are done for the day.